which is fine. I think it's interesting and important to know. But now let's get into why this all works, which is the much more interesting point. So notice what we actually had to change here. When we change from a Z statistic to a T statistic, the critical change is that we're getting rid of this need to know the population variance. That's the hallmark of a T statistic, not having to know a population variance. So the question is, what does that change about our test? Why is it that we have to use a different platform? Why is it that we gain some additional terms? And so to start looking at this, the best way, I think, is to look at the sampling distributions of these test statistics. So in the simplest case, a T sub X bar, so a situation when we don't know the population variance, and a distribution of Z sub X bar, a situation when we do know the population variance. Now, both of these situations assume we know some population mean before treatment, some population that should exist if there was no treatment effect. So we're going to imagine it's that same IQ population, the one we've seen before. And what this demonstration is going to show you is what would happen if we had 5,000 researchers in this section who knew the population variance and were calculating test statistics, and then 5,000 researchers who didn't know the population variance and are computing T statistics for the exact same samples. Right, so we're going to take a sample. This is what the demonstration is going to do. In this section, we're not going to plot the mean. What the researchers down here, for every iteration of this, 5,000 times, they're going to find the mean, and then they're going to compute the Z statistic. So X bar, 89 minus mu, divided by the standard error. So there's our formula. So 89 minus 100, this first researcher would do, divided by the square root of 225 over 2. So these are for samples of size 2. So this person would calculate a Z statistic of negative 1.04. Bam, right there. All right, so we're not done, though. So we're going to imagine we have another researcher who got this exact same sample, these exact same two points. And what that researcher is going to do is compute a T statistic. So it starts again with the mean. Let me go forward here. Minus mu over the estimated standard error. So 89 minus 100, the exact same numerator, but now dividing by the root of the variance over 2. So we have to get the variance now. Notice that this researcher doesn't know anything about the population variance. So this researcher is going to use the sample to estimate it. So let's see how we would do that. Remember, we have to do sums of squares, and then we take those divided by n minus 1. Here are the two data points that this researcher has access to. So this researcher is going to say, OK, 87 minus 89 squared plus 91 minus 89 squared, negative 2 squared, negative 2 squared, or sorry, negative 2 squared plus 2 squared, or 8. So this researcher has found the sums of squares, is going to divide them by n minus 1, and gets a variance estimate of 8. And notice what 8 is here, tiny compared to the population variance. But that can happen. Look how easy it is probably to get, not just probably, look how easy it is to just get two scores close to each other. That's going to happen a lot of the time. So this researcher has a very small estimate of the variance, doesn't know that. It's going to calculate the standard error. And so now it's 89 minus 100 the same thing that this person had, but divided by 2. So a really small value, which results in a really extreme value of t. So notice that this z and this t are for the exact same sample, the exact same two points here. But the difference was that the person on the bottom didn't know the population variance. All right, so notice this center button, this distribution of z sub x bar. You've actually seen this before. Right, when we were doing the normal distribution demos, so I'm going to take normal distributions here. These are what we saw for the sampling distributions. What I'm showing you in that center portion is not this, but as if we computed a z-score for each of these samples. So we could do this in here really quickly. Remember, you can save a standardized version of all these distributions. If you were to do that, here's what they would look like. Unit normal all the way down. Remember, there's always some proportion of the distribution greater than 1.96 in either direction. And it's always 5%, no matter what the normal distribution. So that's what I'm going to be showing you in the middle. Those researchers, nothing's going to change for them for different size samples. But we're going to be curious about what happens for the distribution of t. All right, so let's look at a couple of these quickly. So for samples of size 2, here are the distributions of z sub x bar and t sub x bar. Move a mouse here so you can see. Already something strikingly different here. If you look at the distribution of t sub x bar, we have some really extreme values out there where you never expect them for a distribution of z. OK, let's look at n of 4, so more people in each sample. The distribution of z sub x bar and t sub x bar. Still getting some extreme values of t sub x bar. And the distribution of z sub x bar, identical to what it was before. Let's look at 10. So every sample now has 10 people in it. 
And now these two distributions are getting a bit closer, but they're looking more like each other, not super extreme values of t sub x bar. Oh, let me do 60 here before we look at comparisons. So now every sample has 60 individuals in it. And notice with 60 individuals, we're getting even a shape that looks kind of like the population. So our estimates of the variance are probably pretty good. Now let's compare all of these. So here's z for any size n. Notice no matter what our sample size is, we'll get a z distribution for our test statistic. And 2, 4, 10, and 60. So the best place to look is look at the extreme tails. With a unit normal, we're really not expecting to get a z value greater than 4 or less than negative 4. But with samples of size 2, we're getting t statistics out here easily. In fact, we get t statistics up to 14 or 15 with samples of size 2 without much trouble. With samples of size 4, 10, and 60, notice the likelihood of getting really extreme values of t is dropping off quickly. By the time we're at n of 60, we're getting extreme values almost at the same rate as if we knew the population variance and we're computing a z. All right, so if I go back here, I'm actually going to fill in the p-values here for a value we've been familiar with. So the p-value for 1.96, so the two-tailed p-value there was 0.05. Right? There's 5% more extreme than 1.96 in both tails. Consider the p-value for the same uh, value here, 1.96, but in a t-distribution down here. So I don't know if you all see that in the back, but it's 0 0.0548. Right? So there's 5.48% of the distribution beyond that value when you take samples of size 60. Now I'm going to fill in the rest for you here. By the time we get down to samples of size 2, there's nearly 30% of the distribution with values more extreme than 1.96. Right? That's a lot of the distribution more extreme. A p-value for that is much larger. Right? So getting a value of 1.96 with samples of size 2, getting a t-statistic of 1.96, is not at all an extreme occurrence. It's not unlikely by chance whatsoever. Right? So if you were doing a hypothesis test, and you've got a z of 1.96 or a t of 1.96, the t is much less extreme evidence. Right? That's a very likely sample to get by chance alone. Right, so what's happening here? All right, just a quick summary of what we saw. With small sample sizes, the distribution of t has much more extreme values than z. We also saw that as we increase the sample size, the distribution of t is starting to look more like the distribution of z, which should sort of make sense intuitively. By increasing sample size, our estimate of the variance, the thing we lost, is certainly going to get better. And when sample sizes approaches infinity, this is just something from the derivation of it, the distribution of t is identical to z. So once we get the entire population in our sample, should surprise you, we're estimating the variance perfectly, so the t and the z would be identical, so asymptotically unit normal. Now again, notice what this is capturing. If we're talking about a z-distribution, the two-tailed p-value for 1.96 is exactly 0.05, but within rounding error, right? Because that is the proportion more extreme in both tails beyond positive 1.96 and negative 1.96. But notice that the standard that that sets of evidence here differs now in each t-distribution. If we're taking samples of size 60, the unlikeliness of a 1.96 value is a little higher. Right? It's actually more likely to get a value at that value or more extreme. And once we get down to samples of size 2, the two-tailed p-value, what evidence it really provides for us, is pretty poor. Right? The two-tailed p-value of 1.96 in this sampling distribution is 30% or 0.30. 30% of the distribution is more extreme in the tails beyond positive and negative 1.96. Now another way to see this is let me recouch this distribution and say in each of these, what would be the value that gave you a p-value, a two-tailed p-value, of 0 0.05? Right, so in a z-distribution, well, we know that's 1.96. That's how we look it up. But if I go through and fill these in, notice that you need more extreme values of t to get the same level of evidence. So if we get down to samples of size 2, to get a two-tailed p-value of 0 0.05, you have to get a t of 12.7 or negative 12.7, a huge, huge deviation from zero here. It's going to require your sample means to be much different from what you expected if the null is true, right, to get a t value at 12.7. Because that's what happens just by chance alone. Remember, we're doing this to protect alpha. We're doing all of this inferential statistics just to say what's unlikely to happen if the null is true, and then to only reject the null if we get an outcome that's really unlikely if the null is true. Now notice that I was able to do this or find these particular values, 12.7, 3.182, all of these, 
I was able to do this because I have a computer and I could simulate these outcomes. I can actually see what part of this distribution cuts off the least likely 5%. So it wasn't a very difficult problem for me to solve. But when this was an issue in statistics, it was very difficult to do what I just did. In fact, it was completely impractical. You couldn't simulate all of these sampling distributions. So it had to be solved out analytically. Now you might think the person who figured it out was some sort of you know, statistical genius or something who really put it together and uh, solved this problem, but it turned out to be a really unlikely trio. And it starts with this guy, so William Seeley Gossip. So he was actually born in England. He worked, or sorry, he went to uh, New Oxford, New College in Oxford, graduated with a degree in mathematics and chemistry of all things, and ended up working for the Dublin uh, Brewing Company for Guinness. So kind of a weird place for him to start. And he was working in their labs, basically trying to get an idea of the best production uh, methods for barley. So here's a field of barley. And so what he was really working on was this problem. How can we maximize the yield given different farming techniques or different uh, techniques in the brewing? But he was working with really impoverished data. I mean, think about how this would work. If he had a production method A, they wouldn't want to make hundreds and hundreds of barrels using it. They would want to try it out with just a few. And then they'd have another production method, let's say production method B, with just a few barrels. Now each barrel itself would produce just one value. If we were talking about alcohol percentage, it would just be those three maybe. And then production method B over here, just these three. Right, so comparing these with something like a t-test, he didn't call it them ba uh, back then because it wasn't invented yet, but comparing them was actually problematic. We only have three observations in each group. And we know that we're likely to get very extreme values of that test statistic if the null is true. If these production methods really don't differ, the standardized test statistic comparing these can experience extreme values. Now this was a problem for him because he was working with small amounts of data. It wasn't a problem for most of science back then because they were working largely with huge data sets. Where, remember, if we're taking really large samples, that distribution of T starts to look so much like the distribution of Z that we can almost ignore the problem altogether. But it wasn't a problem that he could ignore because it basically was the case that if he simply used, let's say, 1.96 as his cutoff, he would be false alarming all the time. And that would have huge costs for Guinness right, because they'd be using production methods that probably weren't different. All right, so he struggled with this problem. He was hired there in 1901. And it was only until, uh, I think, 1906 that he uh, got an internship with someone we met before. It was Carl Pearson, KP the guy who actually named the standard deviation, normal distribution, histogram. Uh, he did plenty else. But he had a biometric lab. And so Gossett did an internship over the summer there, 1906 and 7, and worked on this exact problem, how it is we can estimate that distribution of T, what we know is the distribution of T. And he ended up solving the problem with Pearson's help. But there was a big problem with him publishing this. So Guinness, a couple years before, had an issue with a couple employees publishing trade secrets. And so Guinness had a complete embargo on publishing. So no matter what you wanted to publish on, even if it wasn't related to beer, you absolutely couldn't publish it. So Gossett and Pearson both knew how important this discovery was. And so they worked with Guinness, actually, to let him publish. But he couldn't publish with his name, which is probably why you've never heard of Gossett. He ended up publishing in Pearson's journal, Biometrica, under the name Student. And so it was just a pseudonym they picked. And it was the probable error of the mean. Right, so this was this exact problem. What error do we expect in the mean when we're estimating something about the population <coughs> variability, when we couldn't possibly know what it was? All right, so you think this would just solve the problem. This was in 1907. I believe it was 1907. But it actually didn't work very well in general situations. It was really specific to these two group comparisons. And so it didn't really change much for statistics until another person we met, someone who actually turned out to be an enemy of Pearson back then. It was Ronald Fisher. Let me go back here. So Sir Ronald Fisher. So 1920, he got a hold of some of this. It was actually Gossett who sent a, a letter back then to Fisher and said, you know, I produced all these tables of the test statistic I'm calling T. Uh, I don't really know what to do with it. I can use it in this situation, but can't do much else. And Fisher saw this and immediately saw its applicability. And so he ended up restructuring it with his current theory of what's called degrees of freedom and made an incredibly general solution to this. All right, so I tell this backdrop just because I think it's fun that this trio here solve this issue, and that these two guys were just enemies, and it was Gossett who ended up bringing them together. Uh, Gossett was just an extremely likable person. Everybody described him as just really nice. Uh, and when he was asked about the t-distribution in an interview, he basically said, well, yes, I figured it out, but if it was a couple years later, Fisher would have done it anyway. So he basically credited Fisher for most of this. 
But what Fisher did was restructure that probable error of the mean paper into this generalized function. I'll show you what it is here. So it's a generalized hyperbolic distribution. And so these are gamma functions. Totally don't need to know this. So don't worry about all of this crap. But I want you to notice one important function of this. All of this, or all of these values, are pretty much uh, constants. So if we have pi here again, this gamma function is just a function we can perform on these. I'll talk about chi-squares in a second. But there's one free parameter, which are degrees of freedom. So you can give this function one value, and it draws itself out in space. How spread out it is, what its center is. Actually, its center will always be zero. Um, but, the <clears throat> but there's just one value we have to give it, degrees of freedom. And so this is new, the symbol, the 13th Greek letter. And so we'll see this a couple times today. But I've talked only a brief amount about degrees of freedom. I want to give you just a slide that really explains what Fisher thought of it as. So the number of degrees of freedom for a statistic is really formally the number of statistically independent values going into the final calculation. So how much independent, useful information we have. Now degrees of freedom, in Fisher's mind, were also geometric, the, the domain of the basis space of a random vector. It doesn't matter. <coughs> Basically, this way of thinking about it is just fine for us, which is that it's statistically independent information. It's just a counter. It keeps track for us. And we've actually seen degrees of freedom. We've used it before in our calculations. When we worked with the sums of squares, and we talked a little bit about the non-independence of these square deviations, right? we divided our sums of squares by n minus 1. What we were really dividing by was simply the degrees of freedom, how many independent pieces of information were going into this calculation. And it turns out that when we looked at these distributions, that n minus 1 also carries forward. So this n of 2 here, the sampling distribution of t, has one degree of freedom. And this one had three, because we had four people in, that, in each of those samples, 9 and 59. So those were all degrees of freedom we were seeing before. And this function, if we gave it any of those degrees of freedom, would draw out exactly those distributions. All right, so we started this because I wanted to explain why it is t is more spread out. And now we've just added a bunch of terms and not really explained anything. So I want to break this down and simplify this. We're going to get a little in the math stat of it. But basically, we can think of t distributions as the following. So this just means is distributed as. So t distributions, in the mathematical stat of it, is just some function, a normal distribution, divided by, in this value, a chi-square distribution with new degrees of freedom. Now, you've probably all seen chi-square before from Psych 60 when we did count data, or when you did count data. Oops, don't worry about that yet. Uh, and all a chi-square distribution is, right, it represents when you take square deviations divided by some expected value. So we did this, or you guys did this in Psych 60 probably with, you know, a chi-square test of independence, goodness of fit. So it comes up there. Now, chi-squares are really related to normal distributions. And in fact, all of the statistical distributions we've seen and will see all have actual intimate relationships. So this is from uh, 2008, Lemus and McQuestion. This, actually, funny story, this was the first paper I read in this journal when I subscribed to the American Statistician. Uh, and I saw this and I just like put it down. I'm like, nope, <laughs> I'm done, I can't do stats. But uh, all of this is much, much less intimidating than it looks here. So what you're seeing here is basically every major statistical distribution and the functional relationships between them. And so you can get this paper, I'll put it online if you want, or I'll put the PDF of this on. But I want to focus in on just one section. So here we have the standard normal, that's our unit normal distribution, and here we have the chi-square. And there's this line connecting them right here. And all this says is what function on a standard normal can we do to get to a chi-square? And all a chi-square really is is a squared standard normal distribution. So I want to show you what this looks like. Here's a unit normal. I have 100,000 rows, just mean of zero, standard deviation of one. I'm going to go and make a column, just the unit normal squared. There it is. And let's look at these distributions. Here's our standard normal, and here's our squared unit normal. So this is a chi-squared distribution with what's called one degree of freedom. We had one normal distribution that went into this. Now, we could also, if I go back to this data set, Imagine I could have 10 columns of different independent unit normal distributions. I could square each of them and take a sum. That would be a chi-square distribution with 10 degrees of freedom. So this is just a one degree of freedom chi-square. It's nothing very special. It's just a squared unit normal. All right, so that hasn't gotten us very far yet. Let's look at why these parts really represent our t statistics. So here's a very simple one, our t distribution for a single sample mean. 
I said that it's a normal distribution over a chi-square. So this bit, I'm saying, has a distribution that's normal, which means over repeated samples, if you were to repeatedly calculate this, it should be normal. All right, but we did see that. X bar minus mu, that's just our unit normal, or sorry, that's just our sampling distribution of the mean. Every time we took a mean minus the population mean, right, that would just be each of these centered at zero instead of centered at the population. If we just took the deviations, it'll look just like this. And in fact, because of the central limit theorems, we know that even if we started off non-normal, that that top bit is going to be normally distributed. Right? So this really does, across repeated samples, have a normal distribution. All right. So that's the top part. Then why is the bottom a chi-square? All right. So that means that this standard error, our estimates across repeated samples, should have that chi-square shape. And that's going to be because of this variance estimate. Right? N here is just really a constant. That doesn't have any distribution. Whereas S squared is something that we're estimating. And if I go into S squared here, notice that our uh, parameter nu pops up again, degrees of freedom, and it's these sums of squares we're dividing over nu that has that chi-square distribution. And all that's really saying is that over repeated samples, right, this value, the sums of squares, when we estimate it, will actually not have that symmetric shape when it's just a few observations in each sample. It'll look more like that weird one. All right, so why does this account for the t distribution being spread out? Let's actually look at some examples of this. So what I'm going to show you here is actually our distribution of sample variance estimates. If we were to repeatedly take samples and not compute a mean, <laughs> just calculate the variance. So it's going to be look, it look like that really first demonstration we saw. So here's the population variance at 225. What we're going to do in each sample is just take, at first, two observations. We're going to compute S squared, the variance. And remember what that is. That's just the sum of the squared deviations, SS, over nu, n minus 1 in this case. And so we have 90 minus 100 squared plus 110 minus 100 squared divided by 2 minus 1. Now, right away I want to point something out. Our degrees of freedom for this test are 1. Right? This equals 1. Which means that we're saying this bit up here has one unique piece of information. And I want you to see why that is. This is going to be negative 10 squared and this is going to be 10 squared. These values structurally have to be the same. Because no matter what two values we pick, one is going to deviate halfway to the mean, and the other will deviate halfway to the mean. Right? So these values are rigged. They have to be the same. There's one useful, unique piece of statistical information going into this calculation, thus one degree of freedom. So we have 200 over 1 and a variance of 200. So that's going to get put down here. That's our first observation. So we want to see what happens over 5,000 of these. So I'm just going to let it go. And we should be expecting that one degree of freedom chi-square distribution. And that's actually what's getting drawn out for us. A distribution, the shape, when we actually have one unique piece of information that we're actually squaring. So there it is. And so that really is the same as this, that same shape, scaling issues aside. All right, I want to show you for n of 20. So this is now 20 people in each of the samples. Let me get my mouse out of here. And so it's putting out the actual uh, variance estimates on the sampling distribution. So something's already happening here. You notice we're witnessing the force of the central limit theorem drawing things in. Let me do 120. So now every sample even represents the population pretty well. And those variance estimates, something again is happening, the shape is getting a lot more normal. All right, so I want to show you all of these on one plot here. So here they are for 2, 20, and 120. And I want you to notice something critically right away. The mean of all of these, because S squared is an unbiased statistic, the mean of all of these distributions, of course, is sigma squared. right? But notice that the shape is not the same in each of these. There's, of course, huge amounts of skew when we have smaller sample sizes. By the time we get to 120, there's much less skew. Also, the efficiency is going up. Of course, this distribution up here has a much larger variance than this distribution, which just means that our estimates get better as we put more people in our samples. But I want you to know something. This is 120 people in each sample, and we're still seeing considerable amounts of sampling error. We have variance estimates that are off by almost a factor of two in both directions. Now, that's interesting only because if you look at this degrees of freedom 59 distribution, which is less than half as many people as, or sorry, it is exactly half as many people as that 120, Notice that this distribution is almost identically distributed to z. I mean, the p-value, or the t-value we would need to get a p-value of 
is just a little bit bigger than what it would be for the z distribution. So even though we're experiencing a lot of error here for twice as many people, right, in here we don't seem to be experiencing that much error. So it isn't just about the fact that our variance estimates get better, that the variance of these distributions goes down, it's something else accounting for this. All right, so to do that, let's look at the statistic. So what I'm putting up here is the absolute value of each of our test statistics. So the absolute value of t, its extremeness, will be greater than the corresponding z statistic for the same sample under only one condition, when the estimate of the population standard error is less than the true standard error. Notice because the numerator has to be the same. These are the same samples. And so the only way a t could be bigger than a z for the same sample is if you've underestimated the standard error. All right, so when will the standard error underestimate the true, error, true standard error? Well, here it is here. You notice when we actually did that first iteration, we got a t statistic that was more extreme. That happened because we underestimated the true standard error. And that'll only happen when we actually have an s squared that underestimates sigma squared. Now see why this makes sense. Our standard error will only be smaller than, or sorry, our estimate of the standard error will only be smaller than the true standard error when the variance we estimate was much lower than the true variance, right? Because that's in the numerator here. So the only way this whole value could be smaller than this whole value is when actually the numerator is smaller. N is going to be the same in both these cases. It's constant. All right, so let's look at, because we just made the sampling distributions, let's look at when s squared will be less than sigma squared. And I'm going to shade it for you here, just put some boxes up, right? So there's sigma squared, so all of these, that proportion I shaded, are s squared less than sigma squared. Same thing in this distribution and this distribution. But because of the skew, I want you to notice something. When we have samples of size 2, there's almost 70% of the samples that have an s squared less than sigma squared. Right, the mean of this distribution is sigma squared, but that's because we have a ton of observations that spread themselves out to the really extreme high end. Right, that tail drags way out. So remember, the mean is going to be here. Right, that is the mean. But the median in this distribution is going to be over here. The mean gets dragged in the direction of the tail. The median is the point that separates 50% of the scores. We have more than half of the estimates with s squared less than sigma squared. When we go up to this distribution, which has significantly less skew, only 55% will have a variance estimate smaller than sigma squared. And by the time we get to 120 people in each sample, right, 119 degrees of freedom, almost half, 51%, will have s squared less than sigma squared. So the fact that the skew is reducing here is actually what's accounting most for why we're actually getting less extreme values of t when we increase the sample size. Right? Because down here, with samples of size 2, we just have a ton of samples in which we're going to underestimate the population variance. And so we end up with this situation where if you have very small samples, right, you really have to get a much more extreme value of t to have the same level of evidence. And again, remember why we're doing all of this. We just want to make sure that we don't false alarm more often than we're saying. And so we want to make sure that our level of evidence, how we calculate it, actually corresponds to what's true in nature. And what's true in nature is if we have small samples and we're estimating the variance, we're just more likely to get extreme values of our sample statistic, so that t sub x bar. Right, so just notice that the whole point of this is just to protect alpha, to protect science. All right, so that works for our simple t statistic. Right? And the same thing is going to happen for any of the other ones we saw. And so I wanted to come back to this one, especially because of this denominator. So this is the t statistic for two separate sample means. Right, so two groups of people, totally independent, that we've treated differently. And notice that this standard error, right, we already know it should have a chi-square distribution, but this standard error represents something a little bit hard to think about until you see it, I think. So this is the estimate, again, of the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample mean difference. So huge, long sentence here. So I want to show you what that actually represents. What is that the standard deviation of? And so it's the standard deviation of this statistic, x bar 1 minus x bar 2, over repeated samples. So we could actually take a look at this. It's the last demonstration I'll show you for today. So we have the same population, population of 100. And I want you to imagine the null hypothesis is true, which just means that each of our samples are coming from this population. Right? If the null hypothesis is true, each of our samples is trying to estimate exactly the same population mean and variance. That's what the null hypothesis being true means. The mean of these distributions should be the same. 
So let's take two samples. So here's sample one, which will get a mean. Here's sample two, which will have a different mean. Of course it can, due to sampling error. We're not interested in each of these sampling distributions independently. We're interested in the sampling distribution of the difference. And so what we can do is take 70 minus 107, that's negative 37. So on this first iteration, we get one value, negative 37. All right, we can do it again. Random sample over here, that's going to be 108. Random sample over here, 88. We can take the difference of these two. This time, it was a positive, right? So we get one point there. So down here, we're really going to be drawing out the sampling distribution of the difference of these two means. And we're doing it because we need to know the standard deviation, how spread out this distribution is. That'll tell us something about how unlikely our one sample mean difference was if we knew what would happen if the null is true. Let's actually see this happen. We're going to do three of these, so two for each group. And so this sampling distribution at the bottom will have to be normal because our population started off normal. Normal begets normal. So the standard deviation of this is what we're interested in. Let me do it for 20. Very similar things are happening again. Right, so we're seeing a drawing in of the distribution. There's more observations near the center. Because with 20 people in each sample, it's of course harder to have this mean be much different from this mean. Let's do 120 here. So if you have 120 people in each group, of course each group's mean is very unlikely to be different from 100. And so the difference between them, right, we're not even seeing differences beyond 10 or negative 10. And so here they all are. So again, they're all centered at zero which is why when we do the independent samples test, of course, we're comparing against a null hypothesis that the mean is zero, or the mean difference is zero. The variance is getting smaller as we increase, right? That's just the efficiency of the statistic, and all of these are normal. But it's the standard deviation of each of these that we're interested in. How spread out is each of these distributions, right? That's gonna be the thing we actually divide by or estimate in this two mean difference. All right, any questions about that so far? All right. So why is it then, if I go back here, why is it then we have those different estimates? So the variance assumed and the variance not assumed. So I want to talk about that. We're trying to estimate this. But I want you to consider first the variance or the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of each of the different samples. So this is for x1 or x bar 1, that first group. So that's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of this sample mean, the formula we've seen before. Here's the other one. This is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the second group. Now we're interested in doing a linear combination of these two. And by that I mean we're either going to subtract or add. Right? So let me restate things here to get us started. So now I just took away the square root. So notice before, this is the standard deviation of each of those sampling distributions. Here's the variance of each of those sampling distributions. We just squared them. Now the way it's going to work, remember we're interested in the standard deviation or the variance of the sampling distribution of the difference for these two. The way it works, and this is owed to a French statistician, Irene Jules Benhamé, all we have to do is add them. Right? So even though we're taking a difference between sample means, the variance of that difference across lots of samples is just the sum. So it's called the variance sum law. And again, it's just because of linear combinations. So we can write it this way. The variance of A plus B, or A minus B, regardless, is just equal to the variance of A plus the variance of B. And there's one additional bit we'll talk about after the midterm. This has to be minus the covariance of A and B. Now, covariance is like a correlation. It's how much they co-vary together. Remember, this is an independent measures t-test. These two groups are totally independent sets of people, which just means we can completely ignore the covariance. So this formula, the way this works, it's just the variance add. So when you take a difference between two sample means, it's how spread out each of them already is, how much air or noise each sample contributes. So that's the true variance of the sampling distribution of the sample mean difference. We were interested in the standard deviation, so we just take the square root. So this is really what we're trying to estimate. We want to know what that distribution is. We want to know what that value is for our sample. It's going to tell us how unlikely our particular sample mean difference is. All right, but we had two varieties, this equal variance assumed and equal variance not assumed. So I want to give you some intuition about why this is a problem. So again, that concerns a population that would exist if we treated it one way and treated it a different way. And it has to do with what we assume about the variances or the standard deviations of those populations. Now, 
if we want to do the equal variance assumed version, here's what it looks like. You may remember this from Psych 60, a pooled estimate of the variance. We're going to come back to what pooling is. It's just a special kind of average. And this, if we did it over repeated samples, this actually does have a chi-square distribution. Because we're assuming that these two numerators are the same, we can work out the actual linear algebra of it, and it all works out. This actually has a distribution we know. But here's the other issue. If we can't assume the population variances are the same, that means we really should be considering S squared 1 as separate from S squared 2. And because of the way it works out, this ends up being an unknown distribution. So it's called the Barron's fisher problem. It's been around since Barron's and Fisher, so it's been pretty long-standing as an unsolved issue. So fit, figure this out, you get tenure somewhere immediately. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an issue. And we have workarounds for it. So what Jump will actually do is the best approximation of this distribution that we know. But it's not a solved problem. Basically, if we don't assume these are equal, then it creates much more difficult analytic solutions. So we'll come back to this, of course, with the analysis of variance. So that's going to be a type of test that allows us to have more than just two groups. And we're going to, again, have the issue of what do we assume about the variance of our groups? And we're going to have to make an assumption of homogeneity of variance, that the variance is in all of our groups, not just the two, but the 10 or the 20 groups we have is the same. And so that's going to be because we need to get around this issue. All right, so all of these fall back into these different, or different platforms, right? So analyses we've seen that fit into each. But what I want to do now, uh, instead of giving you any new material beyond this, is just talk about some just miscellaneous topics we haven't hit yet and recover something that we have. So p-values, the statistical versus practical significance, and then finally just assumptions of an hypothesis test. All right, so p-values. We've seen these a bunch of times. Right, so they're just a way of measuring extremeness in any distribution, and we have the one and two tail variance of them. Now I want you always to just think of these as just a measure of extremeness. It's just a clever way we have to say how far out in a distribution something is. The problem with p-values is that they're often talked about, and rightly so, in the context of hypothesis testing. So p-value is just the probability of obtaining a random sample with the observed effect, or an effect more extreme, if the null hypothesis is true. Or so they just measure extremeness. But the problem, I think, of bringing them up just in the context of hypothesis test is that it gets wrapped in with this idea of whether the null hypothesis is actually true. Right? A p-value really, really is not the probability that the null hypothesis is true. Right? If you think about it, what does the p-value represent? Right? So the p-value we get is just the probability of the data given HO being true. Right? It's really the probability we would observe data like ours or more extreme, sorry, that should be more like a pipe up and down, given the null hypothesis being true. Now, if it represented the probability the null is true, that's a whole different probability. That would be the probability of HO true. Wow, I switched over to white. Cool. Given the data. So this is something we kind of wish we could know. What is really the probability the null is true given our data? But we don't have that information. We only have the probability of the data given the null is true. Notice these don't work the same way. If I say, what's the probability it's wet outside if it rains? That can be one. What's the probability it rained if it's wet outside? Well, we don't have no idea what that is, right? It could be because somebody sprayed a hose outside. It's not one anymore, right? The probabilities don't commute in that way. You can't just switch the conditionalities, right? So if you see this another way, if we really think about what is the probability the null is true, right? we don't know what it is, it can only have one of two values. The probability <laughs> is one or it's zero. And to be really nitpicky about it, we should make these XORs. So it's one or and only or zero. It can't be both. Right? It really is the case. No matter what the state of the world is, there is a truth out there. Whether or not you know it doesn't change the probability of it. Right? So there's no possible way given this, that your p-value could represent the probability the null is true. It's simply the probability of the data if the null hypothesis were true. It's a tool we're using in making a decision. It doesn't tell us something about the probability of the events in nature, or the probability of the hypothesis in nature. So the p-values, just a measure of extremeness. Uh, the other point I wanted to bring up was statistical and practical significance. Now, statistical significance, everything we've been doing here with hypothesis testing just is a matter of answering one question. Is the observed effect likely or unlikely to happen 
when the null hypothesis is true. That is the only thing statistical significance can give you an idea about. And that's the entire point. Just is it likely to happen if the null hypothesis is really true? Now that's not going to be the only thing we care about as scientists. If we're doing a study for testing a drug, if we're doing anything, we care whether any result is meaningful. Will it make a change for people? Is it telling us something interesting about cognition? Do we care is really the question we have to ask ourselves next. And that's always a question of practical significance, whether an observed effect is meaningful or valuable. Now, there's been a lot of attempts on how to capture practical significance in a number. Some of them you may have heard of, Cohen's D, variants accounted for, there's different ways of capturing them, and we'll come back to them all. But I just want to make sure you get the distinction here. Right? Testing statistical significance says nothing about whether something is important. We can have extremely statistically significant outcomes, things that would be incredibly unlikely to happen if the null is true, that are really totally meaningless. And so these don't really bear on each other. All right, so the final thing I want to talk about are just the ideas of an assumption of a hypothesis test. And so I want to combine these, but I want to tell you what assumptions generally are first. So assumptions of a test just refer to the conditions of nature or the specific research situation that need to be true in order for the test results to be valid. By valid here, I mean accurately reflect the world. And what needs to be true in the world when we're doing certain hypothesis tests for the p-values we get, for instance, or the actual test statistics we get, to be a valid representation of the unlikeliness of certain events. And so all of our tests make assumptions. We have to make them in order to get the math to work, basically. And some of them are reasonable, and some of them are unreasonable, which is why we make changes. So the assumptions of the z-test, I want to squish together here. We can talk about most of them together. So first, random sampling. What that really boils down to for us is that any discrepancy there is between the mean of a sample and the population mean after treatment, or after anything, is due to sampling error only. Now, all this is saying is, if we're talking about a sample that represents the null, so let's take a two-group design, then the group that we didn't treat, we're assuming that that group differs from the population if the null is true by just sampling error. Right? No other systematic effects, no confounding. And we're also assuming that the group we treated is representing a population after treatment and just differs due to sampling error there too. And this is just because we understand sampling error. We can actually work with that. Whereas statistic, or, uh, sorry, systematic error is something we can't really get a handle on. So random sampling. Next is that observations are independent. And this just means that in each individual in our sample provides new information. So independence here is important just because we don't want to assume we have more valuable data than we actually do. Now, this observations are independent is something that we change around in the dependent measures test because clearly, if you measure a person twice, those two observations aren't independent. The way we get around that is each person really only gets to have one value at the end of the analysis, which is just a different score. So they only have one value, so we remove the non-independence between those two observations because we're really testing just a single value. And across people, one person's different score is not related to another person's. Okay, observations are identically distributed. So this, together with the last assumption, makes something we'll call IID, independent and identically distributed data. And all identically distributed is, in whatever group we're measuring, each individual is coming from the same population. Which is to say that you don't have people in your placebo group who actually got treatment. They should all be from the same population. Collectively, they represent one thing out there in the world. The value of sigma is unchanged by treatment, so we address this partially in the two-group situation. Right? We can assume that's true, which simplifies a lot of things. But what we're really saying with this is that the effect of treatment, this is how we normally think about it, is simply to add or subtract some amount or value to each person's score. We think we're really shifting distributions with treatments, not spreading them out or shrinking them in. And the final point, and this is the whole idea of why the central limit theorem is valuable to us, we assume that the sampling distribution is normally distributed in the population. Of course, with t-tests, we're estimating that. That's a whole different business. But we're really assuming that the sampling distributions are normal. And the reason why is we're really looking at proportions that only reflect normal distributions. But the p-values we obtain, really, if it's normally distributed, is accurate. 
they represent the actual probability of randomly obtaining a sample with the given effect or one more extreme if the null is true. Right, so the central limit theorem helps us out immensely with this. We don't have to assume populations are normal to think that the sampling distributions are normal. 